The Game Theory FNAF timeline is complete, and they weren't kidding, part 4 is controversial. Twitter is usually a wildfire, but at this point I can feel the flames from here. Not all hate, don't misunderstand me. The passion was fierce on both sides, in favor of the timeline and strongly against. But don't worry everyone, while I may hate this type of person in US politics, on the Game Theory timeline issue, I am a dirty, dirty centrist. So slices, put on your aprons, and let's bake ourselves some theory critique. Probably for the last time for a while. As much fun and well received as these game theory reactions are, I gotta make some original content. I mean, I did in the meantime, but come on. And maybe, maybe we'll break away from FNAF, do a theory on some other horror games, you know? There's other ones out there. Anyway. Let's gather our ingredients. Straight away, let's recap the parts of this timeline that are pretty non-controversial, slash nearly confirmed. That way we can spend the rest of the time savoring the spice of these takes. Vanessa was pushed to the position of lead security guard from a higher up at Fazbear Entertainment. FNAF AR's purpose seems to literally be collecting remnant en masse. The Pizzaplex was purposely built over the FNAF 6 location. Michael is somehow connected to Glamrock Freddy. Now this one is definitely debatable whether or not we're talking about actual possession or just programmed personality, or even just a metaphor, but I feel like at least symbolically they are definitely connected. And finally, and I never ever thought I would put this in a section labeled non-controversial slash nearly canon takes, but Gregory is definitely patient 46, like 100%. Thank the books for that one. All right, that's settled. What parts of this theory, specifically part four, have the FNAF community up in arms? Well, really, there's three main things that I've seen being hotly debated. Three distinct claims that really come down to the people doing things and the motivations behind doing them. The claims are, Charlotte Elizabeth is haunting the Pizzaplex itself, Gregory is a robot kid, and the biggest one of all, Mrs. Afton is the CEO of Fazbear Entertainment and responsible for the creation of Glitch Trap. Let's go over these one at a time, compare the evidence for and against them, and see where we land. Huh. So this is the new level. I don't like the noises going on, but at least the buzzing is gone. That was driving me crazy. Alright, well, onward I guess. Oh, wait a minute. Hold on, hold on. Oh, there's sponsors down here too. I was getting worried I'd run out of supplies. <clears throat> Today's video is sponsored by Raycon. Perfect. As some of you may know, I still have a full-time job outside of making videos. Because of that, I have to get a lot of my editing done out of the house on a laptop during breaks. I've been using wireless earbuds to do that, and they work okay, but I would always have to come home and check on my computer with my studio headphones to see if the audio was any good. But then came Raycon, and they changed everything. Raycon earbuds have amazing sound quality at an even better price point. That way you can get that premium audio you need without bankrupting yourself. And they have been so helpful for me. I edit for about six hours a day on my laptop and previous earbuds would either hurt after a while, fall out, or the battery would die. But Raycon earbuds are different. First off, they're intelligently designed to fit every size ear. Even after I've used them for six hours all day, I barely even feel them in there. But they're secure, because they don't fall out either. But speaking of editing on the go, honestly the best feature for me is the noise isolation versus awareness mode. If I'm on a break and I don't want to be bothered while I'm working, I can turn on noise isolating mode. And it blocks outside noises so I can be fully immersed in my work. But if I'm on the go or just listening to music around the house, I can switch it to awareness mode. That way I can still hear my kid running around and I don't trip on a cat. All this and Raycon starts at half the price of other premium audio brands. So are you ready to buy something small with a big impact? Click the link in the description box or go to buyraycon.com slash to get 15% off your whole Raycon order. Thanks again to Raycon for sponsoring today's video. Well, at least I'll be able to listen to music while I'm in here. Honestly, it's a major upgrade. All right. Onward. Let's start with Charlie haunting the Pizzaplex. This is a bit of a newer take that I've seen recently, and I believe FNAF started it, but I could be wrong. It was hard to find exactly who proposed this specific interpretation first. I know he at least pioneered the Charlie implications within Security Breach. Regardless, let's look at most of the evidence that has been put forward for Charlie possessing the Pizzaplex. The most obvious pieces of evidence are the Nightmare staff bots, accompanied with the Nightmare own sound effect in their jump scare, the Nightmare own plushes hiding throughout the Pizzaplex and the black and white wires hanging around the Pizzaplex, which looks like the puppet's limbs. Other than that though, as pointed out by Game Theory, the file name for the door to the sticky note silo is labeled Charlie Door 
which does feel pretty damning, I'll be honest. And this isn't necessarily evidence, but the interpretation is that the sticky notes in that room were possibly Charlie trying to teach something its own consciousness, possibly a Gregbot, or possibly even a Charlie robot rediscovering their own memories. Other things going for it is the narratively satisfying nature of this theory. After FNAF 6, Casty spends the foreseeable eternity torturing the actual William Afton in purgatory. But in the real world, a new threat has emerged. A digital recreation of William. And Charlotte rises again to fight it. It all fits with a nice bow. Alright, so what about arguments against it? Well, and this was changed, so don't hold it with too much authority, but originally the file name for the Princess Within Princess quest was Cassidy, which seems to imply that she's still around too and if so, could explain some of the shenanigans going on. Another issue with this theory is that just because the wires are black and white, that doesn't necessarily mean it's Charlie's influence. After all, glowing wires going throughout the Pizzaplex are directly described pretty much in the Storyteller, and they were designed specifically to look like that, so we can't take for granted that this has to be an influence of Charlie. So, okay. What do I think? That's why you're here, right? Well, it's hard to take a definitive stance on it. Out of the gate, I don't think Charlie is a robot, or at least not at this point in the timeline, especially not like we see in the Silver Eyes novels. Now, that is completely possible, don't get me wrong, but it just feels too narratively out of left field within the game timeline. Now, to be fair, a lot of the lore of Security Breach seems to only be understandable by using the books that are currently coming out. So book reliancy isn't a very strong indication either way of a theory's truth. Quite possibly, it's indicative of something being right with the theory. But Charliebot specifically feels too far removed. Or at least, I would want to see more evidence of this kind of thing happening in current FNAF novels, not the very first trilogy of the books. All in all, Charliebot seems like one step too far for me, which is why I'm a lot more open to the idea of Charlie haunting the entire Pizzaplex itself. And for me personally, the most damning evidence is the Nightmare Own plushes all throughout the Pizzaplex. There is no other good explanation for those, besides Charlie's presence being here. After all, spirits possessing an actual location is a tale as old as time. I mean, the most common trope for ghosts is that they're wandering the place in which they died. It's at least way more common of a ghostly archetype than haunting Mr. E. Cheese himself. And narratively, it's really satisfying. It mirrors Afton's first death. We'd essentially have a clash of control of the Pizzaplex. Afton attempting to use technology to take it over, the animatronics, the wiring, and hacking into it, whereas Charlotte is using her spirit to dominate. Just like how Afton tried to use the Spring Bonnie suit, technology, to overcome the supernatural, spirits. But the nightmare owned plushes and the nightmare staff bots, they just make so much sense with this interpretation. It's like Charlie's presence is leaking from her resting place throughout the entire building that was built upon it. All right, on to claim two. Gregbot. Have fun. Evidence for Gregbot would be the weird visual glitches that you see when Vanny approaches you. Freddy saying, I sense you are broken instead of hurt or, I don't know, like you got a couple scrapes. And the post-it note silos seemingly being a place where a crying child could gain their consciousness. Or at least a robot would learn to act like a crying child. Well, like the crying child, not a crying child. Which is what Gregory would be. A robot, whether with solar programming, attempting to recreate the crying child. Some more speculative evidence would be the theme of robotic recreations of people we see in Sister Location and the Silver Eyes trilogy. And honestly, more than that in the Fazbear Frights books. And Afton's line he gives to the crying child in their coma at the end of FNAF 4, I will put you back together. Now for evidence against Gregbot. Okay, but for something else, because that could just be for spoilers, the original line recorded in Security Breach was, I sense you are bleeding. Now, take this with a grain of salt for two reasons. One, it was changed, and even though it's speculated it was changed for an ESRB rating, we can't know for sure, and it's not in the final game. But second, it's not like the people robots in the books couldn't bleed. Charlie bleeds all the time in the Silver Eyes, and she's a robot the whole time. So it's not really here or there. That being said, Direct evidence proving that Gregory is human is admittedly light, but it's the normative position. The burden of proof 
isn't on Gregory being a human. If you are making a claim that a character isn't actually that character, but something else entirely, it's not up to the ones who believe the character is what they say they are to prove it. It's up to the person making the accusation. They have to convincingly prove that the character in question is a faker. With that in mind, I frankly don't think we have enough evidence for Gregory to be a robot. The evidence is tenuous at best, and each one comes with a human explanation. And most importantly, everything we know about Gregory doesn't necessitate him being a robot. Everything we know about Gregory works if he's a human. His mind being taken over by Glitch Trap in one way, it happened to Vanessa, it can happen to Gregory. Him going to school and seeing therapists, of course he would. He's a real human child, and even if he's fully under the control of Afton, he needs to not raise suspicion. Now, the visual glitch we get from Vanny is a little bit trickier, admittedly, but there are a few explanations. First off, it could just be a visual representation of a migraine, especially if Vanny is using a sound distortion device. Hear me out. We know that she appears blurry on the cameras, according to the therapists, and that without Roxy's eyes, the animatronics can't see her, but Gregory can. As FNAF previously pointed out, there is literally an earpiece in the Silver Eyes novels that Charlie uses to hide from animatronics. It plays out this frequency that just messes with their sensors. That could explain why Vanny is blurry on cameras and invisible to the animatronics, but she's never invisible to Gregory. Now I hear you that this sound could be what's causing this visual disturbance in a Gregory robot, but again, if it's playing this odd frequency that's messing with sensors, that sound could just be filling Gregory with dread and mental exhaustion, causing a fun effect that the developers chose. All in all, what I'm trying to say is I do not think there is nearly as much evidence as I personally need to jump on the Gregbot bandwagon. So for now, I'm firmly in the camp of Gregory as a human. All right, going into the final round, we're one to one. Tie game, it's all down to this. Get this theory and some boxing gloves and ring that bell. We don't have a bell? All right, I guess ring that subscribe button. Because if you've made it this far, I'm pretty sure you like FNAF and theories, and that's pretty much all we cook here anymore, so, you know, it really helps out. Thank you. Clara Afton, or to be more official, Mrs. Afton, is the CEO of Fazbear Entertainment and is the one pulling the strings behind everything, all in an attempt to recreate the family that was taken from her. There's honestly practically no evidence for this, which MatPat readily admits. There's not a lot of evidence for it, so it's just kind of like one of those like gut impulses that I, as a theorist, have been studying media franchises this particular franchise especially i feel like that's the direction it, it will be heading or kind of like how they're how they're kind of crafting that story like it's it's a lot of speculation with very limited evidence points but i, I think that's where it's headed but in defense of the theory it does have some compelling evidence first the immortal and the restless now, it isn't the strongest because the security logbook seems to tell us that Michael relates to Clara, so that whole thing might have just been Michael's frustration with no one believing him about everything going on, but way more convincingly, the mock Afton family. It is weird that Mrs. Afton is at the head of the table. Why would it not be William? She hasn't been important thus far. It seems so strange to put her in such a prominent location. And for me, even more compellingly, Spargo Sons on Reddit pointed out that this song in Security Breach is a remix of Crumbling Dreams. Ballora's song. If Ballora really was made for Mrs. Afton, like Circus Baby was made for Elizabeth, not in order to kill Mrs. Afton just like it was made in their image or with them in mind, then this would be really strong evidence for Mrs. Afton's presence in Security Breach. Other than that though, that's it. Now, evidence against it really doesn't exist for the same reason as the Gregbot theory. It's hard to find evidence to say that a character isn't involved when there's no evidence of the character existing at all, besides the fact that William had kids, and I don't want to imagine that he just mitosis them out. Really, in the games, we have had zero zero direct mention of a Mrs. Afton, so this would be entirely out of left field. Now, for an argument against it, we already have a named CEO of Fazbear Entertainment, at least in the books, Mr. Burroughs from The Storyteller. To help settle on one or the other, let's go over the CEO of Fazbear Entertainment in the game's actions, and we'll see if those actions steer us in either direction. Fazbear Entertainment wanted to reinvigorate the brand, but to do so, they needed to clear their bad name. So they hire a random indie dev to make a bunch of weird and wild games to make fun of and make light of what happened in the past, and possibly even cover it up. They then go and make a VR game to really put that nail in the coffin. 
Supposedly, to make this more authentic, they scan in the motherboards from the old animatronics to perfectly recreate their motions. Time passes. They develop the special delivery service. More time passes. They build the Pizzaplex directly on top of the FNAF 6 location. At some point, they pretty much force Vanessa into the lead security guard position, even though she has no qualifications to be there. And that is everything we know for certain the Fazbear CEO did. Or at least, everything we are very, 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 very sure of. Right now, there's one big issue with this timeline. At some point midway, either camp could reasonably assume that William takes control of the company, especially by late security breach, as it's all done through emails, a digital space that Glitchtrap would thrive in. But one big issue is the catalyst that created Glitchtrap in the first place, scanning motherboards into the VR game. This feels sinister. It's spoken about like it was purposely done to create glitch trap. But if that's so, then whoever was calling the shots would have had to be on William's side since the beginning, at least before the VR game was created. To me, that feels like the main argument in favor of Mrs. Afton. It gives us a possible person who would be on William's side before glitch trap is created. If she was alive, she would have received all these letters of bankruptcy and foreclosure after the dust settled. She would be the next of kin to take over the the company. Quick side note before we get to Mr. Burroughs, I saw a lot of y'all bringing up ages again. I don't think it's a useful point. There's no reason to assume she's the same age as William. All we know is that she had a kid who's old enough to be head and shoulders taller than his younger brother, but young enough to think, but young and dumb enough to think that this prank was a good idea. So like 13 to 16. So if she had a 13 to 16 year old in the year 1983, then she would have had him sometime in 1970 to 1973. According to the CDC, See, the average age for first-time parents was around 21.4 at the time. I know that sounds young, but keep in mind, in the 70s, homes were like $13 and your union factory job got you six figures. Unlike today's economy. Thanks, Reagan. Anyway, if we assume that Mrs. Afton was around 20 in 1970, then by Security Breach, a game that takes place in the mid-2030s, she'd be approaching or in her 80s. And like, sure, yeah, that's old, but that's not too old to be doing anything that we see in Security Breach, especially as a CEO. That's just the shot caller. She's not really getting her hands dirty herself at all. All this is to say, age-wise, Mrs. Afton could be the CEO, if she's still alive. But I think that's just a convenient answer, because we're taking a question, the CEO of Fazbear, which we know nothing about, and giving it an answer, Mrs. Afton, which we know nothing about. So like, sure, I guess they fit together. Let's instead look at someone we do know about, Mr. Burroughs. Right away, he feels like a William parallel. He wears purple. His name is literally the thing rabbits live inside of. It makes too much sense for him to not be William, or at least a William slave like Vanny and Gregory. But Here's the thing, I don't think he is a slave to William. Rather, I think that's the red herring. Hear me out, Mr. Burroughs is cold, calculating, and cynical, just like William, sure. But he's always only described as being greedy or money hungry, wanting to be rich by any means necessary. He's never actually described as evil or sinister, and he's never once shown to be doing something by the order of Afton. Even more, from William's usage of the Spring Bonnie suit in the games and his characterization in the Silver Eyes novels, it's clear that Afton loves these animatronics. At his very core, Freddy's is the world to him. So much so that in the books, at times, he doesn't even feel comfortable talking without wearing the Spring Bonnie mask. Mr. Burroughs, however, he hates Freddy's. He thinks it's stupid. He makes remarks about how much he hated the dumb photos of Freddy's hanging in the office. He's stated to have only bought Fazbear Entertainment because he knew he could turn it for a profit. I mean, the whole plot of the storyteller is literally how little he respects the creative team, thinking they're all useless, firing them, and trying to replace them with an AI program that'll do the work for him. All this to say, Mr. Burroughs seems like the perfect stooge. So, could the actual Actions of a Fazbear CEO we see in the games be explained by just a dumb, money-hungry CEO? To a point, yes. He would know that you couldn't just reopen restaurants and assume all is well. You would need to get a new image to the public eye. What better than a series of games coming out that makes light of all those tragedies, putting it all behind the company? Even better, let's make a VR game to own it ourselves. What's that? 
programming is taking too long and it's difficult, it's wasting time, and more importantly, money? Screw that. We have heaps of old electronics. Just scan some of them in. I'm sure it'll be fine. No, don't bother checking for viruses. What could be on there? Just like that, Glitch Trap is born. But then, why would they build the Pizzaplex on top of the FNAF 6 location? To save money. They already own, or at least at one point, owned that lot. Why bother spending money on a new one or going through the arduous process of trying to source land? Just demolish whatever was there, pave it over, and build the Pizzaplex on top of it. What do you mean sinkhole? I'm not gonna inspect it, don't care, go build. Honestly, the only thing that doesn't add up with this interpretation is Vanessa being pushed to the top of the security guard position without any prior experience. But the storyteller gives us an out here because at the end of it, Mr. Burroughs dies. Specifically, he's trapped inside the storyteller by the glitch trap virus and is left to suffocate. Once the Pizzaplex is finally finished being built, all William would have to do is get rid of Mr. Burroughs. Not publicly, make sure the company still thinks he's alive, but then command all of his communications electronically through glitch trap. That's how we get a Pizzaplex with William A. Ifton as the CEO. He isn't really the face of the company, but he is the one in control. He just found a person to take that place and made a home inside of him. Or in other words, a burrow. All this is to say that I think a greedy CEO, or possibly literally Mr. Burroughs, makes way more sense to explain Fazbear Entertainment's actions after FNAF 6 than Clara Afton does. Because like I've been saying for more than a year now, the ultimate villain throughout the entirety of the Freddy's franchise is capitalism. Now, if you're confused on how the books help us interpret these games, go ahead and click that video right there where I go into GGY and what it tells us about Gregory and his motivations. Again though, whether or not I agree or disagree with this entire timeline, and to be fair, I think I agree with more of it than I disagree. What MatPat and the whole game theory team has done here is truly commendable. So much so that I think it's worth a reward. Matthew Pathew, to make up for somebody who's belittled your work in the past, I'll give you two claps. In the meantime, a huge thank you to the best patrons, the Toasted Slices, Emberisk, Charlie Bean, Lovey Puppy, Stormachow, Just BKZ, Chickpea, Lola Fembo, The Viper 26, Lehan, James Reiner, Emily De La Sierra, Snow Blossom, Comrade Nika, Raven Eris, Glamrock Bonnie Isn't a Ghani, Bucky Ray, Mystic Angel, The Idiot Central, Mac Dave, Phantom Plays, Emmy Layton, Inkline Game Studios, Achilles, Memento Mortem, Super Moosh, Owner A. Johnson, Jackson Davis, I. I. Untrusted Life, Kevin's Adventures, Blake, John Mann, Natty C, King Coda, Dionysus, MD Switchy, Flip, Luce, and Natsu Tanaka. And until next time, as always, stay toasty, slices.